Yeah, and, and that guy, mate, when I was 19, he was about a year or two older, so he was about 21, uh, literally uh, was drunk, again, the drinking thing, uh, drunk, had a row with his missus. She left him. He was working in a warehouse at the time, had a standing blade in his pocket, pulled it out of his pocket, cut his own throat. Yeah. So I never used to have drink in my house, because if it was there, I'd drink it. I'm sounding like a proper fucking al alcoholic now, aren't I? Maybe I was. <laughs> it was never diagnosed, but it, it's, it's fucking it's not sounding good as I talk about it. I, I don't have enough fucking money to have a will. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, in, I'm too young to have a will. And then he says, well, you've got a son. The, the main reason you want a will is for your son. Because if anything happens to you and your wife, then where, where's he going to go? He'll go into the system. Yeah, in, in, inactivity is literally a new smoking, mate. Like, yeah. it's, it's the biggest, for, for all-cause mortality, mate, I think being inactive yeah. contributes the most to, to, to people getting sick and dying of different diseases. Your long-term goal is maybe to ask my boss for a pay rise. So how am I going to do that? Well, I need to create more worth in the workplace. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to take on more accountability. Well, how am I going to do that? I'm going to start developing my knowledge around the particular area of the business. How am I going to do that? Go on fucking YouTube two hours a day. Right, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the behavior goal. It's a nice seat this, mate. Fire out there. I don't know, mate, staring at your fucking mug for the whole episode. <laughs> Maybe not you're lucky, the Mate, end. you're lucky as fuck. I might take my glasses off for the first time, mate. <laughs> you're a fucking prick. <laughs> so how are we going to introduce this then? Just usual way. If you've got it in you. Yeah, all right. Welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Today's guest is nobody. <laughs> Today, uh, Danny and Paul are reflecting on 11 episodes and chatting about what we've uh, what we've been talking about this whole time. Yeah. So, what 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 is your view on what we're uh, what's what we're my covering? View? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I guess as the name suggests, it's the everyday perspective. Um, and you know, we've talked a little bit about the fact that we've got a level of expertise. So we've got both got professional qualifications within fitness. You've got eight years experience as a PT. Yeah. I've got ten years experience as a PT. Um, I obviously work in a fairly senior position for the UK's largest healthcare charity. Um, so, uh, clinical fitness national lead. So I work within primary care essentially, but more within, uh, exercise rehabilitation. So exercise rehabilitation is what my degree is in as well. Yeah. Um, so I did a Basra accredited degree, um, in that. So that's my expertise. So I can talk about that, but I know from working in primary care for, for the healthcare charity that, uh, I work alongside the national leads across the other service line. So things like general practice, GP, uh, physiotherapy, physiology, mental health. Um, so I know like their level of expertise. So I don't want to necessarily talk about things that we aren't experts in. We can talk about fitness and exercise rehabilitation, um, about business because you've obviously run what three, four businesses yeah, four. in what like uh, retail, entertainment, yeah, all sorts of shit, yeah. really. Yeah. E-commerce. Yeah, e-commerce. So you've obviously got an area of expertise within like entrepreneurship um, and obviously personal training. And then I do within personal training, clinical fitness and exercise rehabilitation. Um, but I think we both know enough that we know what we don't know. Yeah, I think it's recognising that as well. Yeah, yeah. So I think what, what our purpose really is, is obviously, you know, it, it is around sort of men's health, men's lifestyle, men's mental health but we aren't experts in mental health. Um, you know, we, we've, we you know, probably had our ups and our downs in life ourselves. And we certainly know people that have obviously really struggled with it. Yeah. Um, sadly, like some that have, have taken their lives or attempted to take their own lives. Um, but yeah, beyond that, I'm not an expert. And I don't want to talk because it's such a, a, a delicate subject. There are obviously some clinically diagnosed conditions yeah. that need a particular course of treatment um, delivered by experts and professionals in that area. And those people should be seeking help from those individuals. Yeah. I really think that if people are truly struggling with mental health, they should go to the GP yeah. and that's the official advice. I think, I think our podcast is aimed at leveling up men. Yeah. Making their lives better by listening to experts, get the best information they can get. Cause I've definitely learned out of our 11 episodes so far that, you know, I've learned a lot mm. and anyone watching would have learned a lot as well because yeah. these people that are coming on and talking, they're, they're, they're incredible. Yeah. They're incredible people that know a lot more than the everyday person that, that, you know, that we all think we know a lot, but we don't really, we don't really. No, I completely agree. And I think, 
you know, I, I might be in a, you know, a, a fairly senior position now and, and everything else, but, you know, I, I made a transition um, in my thirties. Yeah. So prior to that in my twenties, you know, I grew up in a, a quite a poor area. I didn't leave school with very good education. As a result, I just went from like one dead end unskilled job to another. But you know what? I think that's all right though. Yeah, it's Because fine. I think in your 20s, I think that's the time to really find who you are and what you want to be. Yeah, yeah. And it, it is not, it's not actually time that I regret because I definitely learned some skills and we talked about on Dan's podcast that you can then use in other roles. I think the point I'm making is that, you know, essentially I'm an everyday bloke. You are the same, right, yeah. you know. What I mean, we both come from humble beginnings. We've grown up on council estates, um, and we've both, you know, been less schooled and educated at points in our life than we are right now. So I think we have an understanding of the obvious questions that people might ask. And I think I think where what we've done a really good job of, I hope, is that we get these experts in, um, and we try and bridge that information. And don't be wrong, like both Will and Ed. Sort of, you know, talking from a medical perspective, we're amazing. I think at explaining things very clearly, and you can tell they're skilled clinicians, and that they're, they're, yeah. they're good at doing that. But I think as we go, we're going to come across other professionals in whatever industry that might pitch the information at too high of a level, um, because it's very easy. I think when people have had a, an acquired knowledge for such a long period of time, they forget sometimes that people have such a, a low amount of knowledge around that particular area that sometimes the language that they use and the things they say can be lost in translation. I think I do that all the time, just in general, like PT talk, you know, I assume that everyone knows yeah, what yeah, yeah. calories, macros, you know, just basic things that, well, again, I say basic things, but 80%, 90% of the population probably don't think of it like that. You know, they don't really look when they're eating a packet of crisps, they don't really look at the the traffic light system as as Dr. Will said in, in things like that because they just you know they don't really mean fuck all to them yeah 100% so I think it's about trying to to get on experts as you say in areas that might improve the situation of guys um, but you know use our knowledge of what we don't know to pull information out of them and make sure it's like just dialed down to the right level that the everyday below the everyday person and, you know it's obviously a, a men's health podcast but i think there's there's tons of usable information for all genders and everybody so yeah and i think the reason the reason we've we're specifically looking at men's health is because again we don't want to talk out of our wheelhouse yeah you know i don't want to talk about menstrual <laughs> menstrual cycles and stuff like that because we don't experience it i have no clue on it you know and there's plenty of like female podcasts out there that talk about all these different things the same as what we're doing but with you know the female half and I just, I just, um, I just don't want people thinking that, you know, we're some sort of uh, male chauvinists that only want to, you know, level up men and stuff like yeah. that. It's not that at all. I think we're just really conscious, like you said earlier, about talking about what we know, yeah. getting the experts on talking about you yeah. know, what they know. But I think too many times men are telling women how they feel and they shouldn't, <laughs> you know, they're, they're telling them how they should be in the workplace. They're telling them how they should be here, there and everywhere. It's just a lot easier, you know, for us to focus on ourselves and what we know yeah we are blokes you know we we know people that have been in low mood i think, I think everyone everyone gets pissed yeah, off yeah it's well, mate the fucking these days is where everybody's struggling um but yeah i think we want to just try and provide a little bit of inspiration some information and, and try and help you know guys primarily because as i say we're blokes with you know parents of boys and you know we're, we're we're friends of lads so you know that's our that's all where we are, but ultimately, a lot of the information that I think we're going to produce on this out on this podcast is is going to be applicable to everybody. Yeah, I mean, look at the, some yeah. of the conversations we've had already. I mean, Will talked about you know sort of um, public health um, that applies to both, and he did a really good job of, of making that clear. Of course, it does. Cardiovascular disease. All right, yeah, it's the biggest killer in men. Women still get cardiovascular disease. No, I was I was so shocked about when he was saying about how women how it affects women different to men where men get the chest pain yeah and the women women get a backache and a joy yeah. that i've told all my clients that straight away i was like you need to be aware of this because yeah. that's how it gets you yeah. you know it may not be as common as men yeah. um primarily i reckon that's because men when they get well in general we're just greedy bastards and we get fat and get bad hearts <laughs> yeah maybe i don't know but, <laughs> but, but you know you know what i mean yeah you? like women just don't know that i don't but even if like, you know, in that, in that scenario, you know, obviously it was the biggest killer in men, like women. Um, I think for women, it's dementia, which, you know, arguably is far worse. But, you know, yeah. equally women, you know, they're, they're married to men. You know, they're, they're 
you know, daughters of men, uh, mothers of men, you know what I mean? So it, it doesn't matter that it's like, it's, we're talking men's health because that applies to everybody. And, and even some of the mindset stuff we were talking about being positive and setting goals in a previous situation, like we've talked loads of times already. Like I think Ricky touched on it with jujitsu. I think Mark talked about it. I think you mentioned it, but the, the ripple effect, the impact that that has, are, you know, on the people around you. Yeah. So, you know, so again, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's geared towards blokes because we are blokes, but you know, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it doesn't matter. The I mindset think. in the workplace, for example, yeah. if, if you're doing more, whether you're a man or a woman, yeah. you still get ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you still get ahead. So, yeah. So I think, you know, that's ultimately the goal, isn't it? It's just to keep talking to these experts. And I think for us, if we can just, I think, grow this channel, and this is one thing we've not said, but if you're listening, please subscribe if you haven't already. And that's because the bigger reach we've got, the more guests and the better guests we can get on. Um, and, you know, that's ultimately what we want to keep doing is keep providing really good content, really good information by, you know, by more more and more experts. And I think if, you know, if we can grow the channel, um, then that's going to allow us and facilitate us to do that. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> the, thing that, the thing is with what we're trying to do more so than anything is if, if someone's watching, they can pick out a little bit or if they just enjoy watching the actual podcast, it'll make you feel a little bit better, you know? We're not experts in, like you said, mental health mm. and stuff like that. To be honest with you, I don't want to fucking be an expert in mental health. I actually quite like just uh, just coming on here, trying to help people, trying to get good people on, mm. and then just go from there, really. Yeah, and I think that that's it, isn't it? Um, and I think we've had some really good guests so far. So I think we should do a little reflection of the last 11 episodes can't believe it's like 11 episodes already mate yeah. that's flown by so so fast as well but it literally feels like it was five minutes ago that we were stood in flo's car park yeah like chatting about, about this idea it, yeah. you know what i mean and yeah i remember you saying at the time where you know i think i'm good at coming up with ideas sometimes and you're maybe a little bit better at application because of your experience in yeah in oh, the business that winds me up so much when people ask you something or talk about something yeah. And they never action it. They just never bother. They just fucking, they go, oh yeah, I want to do this. I want to do that. And they never ever bother. That's what I said to you in the car park that day. I was like, if you really want to do this, let's not fuck around and let's just do it. Yeah. A couple of months later and we're here now, you know. And um, I think that's, my prob that's probably my biggest advice to people when they're stuck in a shit job or shit situation. So they just keep fucking moaning about it and keep feeling sad for yourself and sorry for yourself. But just get off your fucking ass. And actually go and do it, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Just actually go and do it. And what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. Same as the podcast. What can? What's the worst that can happen? What the podcast doesn't work out? What we've we've not wasted any time because we fucking enjoy it. Yeah, you know, it's 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 all about doing it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, if you can see like a light at the end of the tunnel of why you're going to do something, I think it's just the biggest fucking reason to, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I think for me as well, like we were literally just laughing offline because I I literally hate this. What, talking about yourself yeah like who gives a shit you know what i mean um yeah. and also just being center of attention mate i'm yeah i'm just i'm not a fan at all but i, I love sitting down and, and having conversations with people and i like learning yeah exactly. my biggest thing is like yeah. all the people we get on are so so fucking such cool people yeah and and they got so much knowledge and information that you come away from there and you think fucking hell yeah. that's really cool today yeah, definitely. And, and despite the fact that I feel a little bit uncomfortable, like being on camera and talking about myself, I think, I, I think about the, the why and why we're doing this. Yeah. And I think, you know, the fact that we're sat down and we're trying to provide really good information for people. Um, for me, that just, yeah, it kind of eliminates that discomfort that I've got. So, something that sticks in my head straight away is when Trev come on and mm. he just said about having a will and why you should have a will. Straight away, I was like, I ain't earn enough fucking money to have a wheel. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, in, I'm too young to have a wheel. Yeah. And then he says, well, you've got a son. The, the main reason you want a wheel is for your son. Because if anything happens to you and your wife, then where, where's he going to go? He'll go into the system. It's not It's not guaranteed that he's going to go with the person that you want him to go mm. to. And I, that there, I would have never known that. You, do you have ever known that, really? No, mate. You I mean, know, you it's really it's, fucking thought of it. Yeah, although I did go home afterwards and tell my other half and she got quite mad because apparently she's been trying to tell me that for about five months and I just haven't been listening. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> actually, yeah, literally, mate, she got red-faced about it. But um, I think, but that's to the point, isn't it? I think sometimes, you know, as a bloke, you know, when you kind of got loads of other shit going on, yeah. you know, you're not always, you can't always see the wood through the tree. Sometimes you're just like blind to the things that are right in front of you. Yeah. And, you know, you might have your other half at home or, or your kids or whatever telling you stuff and you're just not hearing it at all. 
And I think for me, sometimes hearing that from an expert, um, it just resonates a bit more. I've just never ever th thought of it, ever. No, you know I mean? but you know, it, this is the thing, isn't it? I obviously talked about the Dunning-Kruger effect a, a few weeks back and it literally is like, you just don't know what you don't know. That's exactly it, isn't it? They just, they think they're doing things right not just in personal trip, but in, in loads of different aspects of life. And really they're not, they're not really the fucking, including me and you, you know, yeah. and, and you know, you always think, oh, I'm all right with this. I'm all right with that. And you're not, even with like financials, with money, with your relationships, with your kids, with everything. There's definitely things that you can look at objectively and definitely improve on, but we never have the fucking time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. I think people have talked to me before about decision fatigue especially these fucking days when people are so busy, they just, they can't think about what they need to be doing. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that, and that confusion around what they need to be doing in the gym is enough to make them not go to the gym. Do you know what though? That's a fucking sad thing, isn't it? Mm. That we're all so busy that we, we mm. just can't be fucked to make any more decisions. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's fucking sad really. Isn't it? Yeah. We should be frolicking bareback in the fields, mate. Doing That's what? what we should, frolicking. Bareback. Yeah, frolicking. frolicking. Through, the, <laughs> through the fields, bareback. <laughs> What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> just being free, mate. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Being okay. free, you know? You're not well, with free, it, are we? With AI, AI coming in, we'll be jobless soon anyway, mate, so we can do what we want. Oh, then. don't get me fucking started on that. I, I, I literally will not on this podcast, mate. So, uh, <laughs> so, so hold that thought. Um, but yeah, let's, let's go back and like chat through the guests then because we've we've had, obviously, 11 episodes done now. Yeah. Um, and I think this is, this is something that might be worth a mention as well is is obviously the areas that we're trying to cover. So we kind of list it on the YouTube channel if people have gone there and had a look, but you know, we're trying to cover off, I guess, five key areas, aren't we? So you've got, I guess, like health and medicine, and that's where we're going to get our doctors in and those experts, you know, within that field. Um, and then I guess, you know, that's kind of painting a picture to some extent. And then from that, about what do we do? That's where we then look at sort of fitness and health experts. That's where we've had Jero and Pete on, um, or fitness and nutrition experts. Um, and then we obviously talk about mindset. Um, and okay, great. So I know that I'm fucked. I know that I'm not very healthy. Okay, this guy's just told me about how I can get in the gym and get started, but I still don't really feel like I want to. So that's what we bring in, obviously, the mindset guys. Um, and that's kind of a weird term, mindset guys, not mindset guys. But they're people that have obviously you know, done amazing things, um, despite adversity. Yeah. And hopefully if, you know, you can take a little something from them, you know, if you can see what they, th those have achieved, those guys have achieved, um, and take a little bit of inspiration there to then get up and go to the gym. Yeah. Knowing that maybe you need to, because you've just had a doctor telling you that, you know, there's these health risks associated with being inactive and eating poorly. You know, you've got a little bit of knowledge now around what you can maybe do maybe a bit of uh, reassurance from maybe working with a professional and now you're in the gym and that's cool. And then that's one component, but then obviously everything else that you do as well, sort of relationship, family, business. I think the gym's huge though. And I'm not yeah. saying it's just for a PT, but from a physical point of view, I think it fucking, it helps so much. Doesn't yeah. It? I don't think you can understate how, how much yeah. it, it, it really is. Yeah. Mate, in, in, in activity is literally the new smoking, mate. Like yeah. it's, it's the biggest for, for all cause mortality, mate, I think being inactive yeah. contributes the most to, to, to people getting sick and dying of different diseases. Your your risk of those diseases, things like cardiovascular disease, yeah. and Ed talked in length about that, um, all those things are drastically reduced if you're physically active. And, you know, that isn't just going to the gym. Yeah. Um, you know, it isn't just going to the gym for an hour a week. And like you say, plodding around, it is you know, sort of go in there with a bit of purpose and a bit of structure, but also the rest of the week walking as well. So it's, it's super key, but we'll come back onto that. Um, and then obviously, yeah, we, we cover the business and leadership and taking a bit of control of your professional situation. Um, and then finally, we, we talk about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because it's something we're obviously very passionate about. Yeah. Um, and something that I've had in my life for 15 years. Yeah. And I've been in and out, but it's always been there when I needed it. And there's definitely been sort of periods when I was younger, when I didn't have any, you know, I wasn't in good relationships, didn't have good people around me necessarily, um, had very, you know, sort of very little in the way of opportunity and purpose in my life. Yeah. And definitely scenarios where I could have gone in a very opposite direction. And I think Brazilian Jiu Jitsu through those periods literally kept me on the straight and narrow, I really do. Um, 
So I think for me, like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is massively powerful for people. Certainly men, I think <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen it completely change like females as well. So it's not just guys. I've seen some, yeah. some girls come in who have been through trauma and, you know, are kind of a little bit lost and they've, you know, sort of gained power and confidence through Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, and it's very applicable, obviously, for females and, and very effective for smaller people as well, whether they're male or female. So I think for everybody, but I think certainly for guys, having that that outlet and that team around you, as Toby talked about, um, yeah, I think that's really key. So I think that's why we cover those five categories and that they're relatively broad. Um, but again, going back to what we talked about at the very beginning, the whole point of that is that we create this this foundation yeah. for, for guys to maybe start you know, whether it's just one bit at a time, but start going, right, okay, what can I do? Can I join a jujitsu gym? Okay, I'm, I can't afford it, right, okay, well, maybe I can eat healthier and start eating takeaways, quit the smoking, quit the booze. Yeah. And ask me about that later, because I recently quit drinking and that's yeah. been, a, been a hugely impactful. So yeah, so let's go back in and maybe sort of just work our way through the guests um, in each of those categories. So obviously medicine and health, we had Will. Will, yeah. Dr. Will, yeah. Um, yeah. actually legend. The nicest guy in the world. Yeah. Yeah, well, super nice guy, but painted a really interesting picture, I think, of, of I guess, the health of the nation. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, you know, we talked about, is there a, like a, a sort of, a, I guess, a health gender gap? And there kind of is and there isn't, I guess. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, everybody has their own worlds, as we've talked about already. Men, you know, you know men and women suffer with, you know, sort of uh, mental health problems um, and low mood. And both both genders, both sexes, you know, will self-harm as a result. Um, but the, you know, it's obviously clear that men, yeah. you know, take it to a, a different level. Um, and what I think- What did he use to, to describe that? Do you say like clinical or like, just said with, where men are a lot more like, I can't think of the word. I think he said final. Final, that's yeah. what he said. Well, just a lot more final. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just the, the methods in which we use, I think are a lot more final. Um, but mate, I mean, you know, I know lads that have taken their own lives. Um, I think I've told you this before. When I was 19, I used to hang out with a guy. I've got a picture of this, so I'll show you afterwards. I used to hang out with this guy um, and he was um, at a, a funny upbringing mm. and was a little bit, um, yeah, he, was, he used to get a bit full on with women. Not in like a bad way, but he used to get into a relationship and, and kind of really give himself to that relationship. And when it go yeah. tits up, he'd take it so bad. Devastated, yeah. Yeah, and, and that guy, mate, when I was 19, he was about a year or two older, so he was about 21, uh, literally uh, was drunk, again, the drinking thing, uh, drunk, had a row with his missus. She left him. He was working in a warehouse at the time, had a standing blade in his pocket, pulled it out of his pocket, cut his own throat. Somehow didn't fucking die, mate, but I'll show you this picture. But well, didn't die? No, somehow survived. I guess he didn't go in that deep, I don't know, but cut himself literally from here to there. I've got a picture, mate. I'm not exaggerating. It Are was- he's still alive now? Yeah. Yeah, he's around somewhere. Fuck I've not seen him me. for years. That's like, a Yeah, to, to, to Mark's point about networking, keeping the people around you, he probably wasn't the sort of guy I wanted to continue hanging out with, but yeah, insane, mate. Like, so I was 19 and I just had one of my best mates at the time cut his own throat. Um, one of my other mates took a, an overdose at the time, didn't die again, but again was hospitalized in a coma for a day or two as a yeah. result. Um, and I know lads that have taken their own life. Um, and you know, it's, 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 mate, it's, it's so sad because we were looking at something the other day. I think it, I can't remember what our website it was on. I think it was the campaign locally, uh, the calm campaign. But obviously, you know, suicide doesn't have a face, does it really? Like you, you, you know people that have either attempted or committed suicide and on the surface they seem fine. Yeah, we were saying there was someone locally that, that committed suicide and he was uh, a friend of someone that I knew. Mm. And, and she was saying you'd never ever think yeah. that he would just go and commit suicide. You yeah. Know, absolutely, life of the party, always happily smiling. But really underneath he's not. And it's hard to know, isn't it? Yeah, and I think going back to the gender thing, I think maybe some of the differences there, and this is obviously what a lot of the campaigns are alluding to at the moment, is that women may sort of cry for help a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so they may attempt suicide, but yeah. it's it's you know it's in a way that you know the the survival likelihood is quite high, but it does raise the alarm a little bit for them. Yeah. Um, but also they just naturally, I think, a bit more open to talking to their friends and their girlfriends and the people I around I don't them. know about you, but I remember back in school when like you're 10, 11, you know, towards the end of school and you used to get a lot of girls like 
just cutting themselves. I don't know if that was like a thing just in my school, but I used to notice there used to be girls like just cut themselves. Yeah. Like nothing to kill themselves, yeah. but like just just little lines, little bits of pieces. Yeah, I, I don't remember any bit of like school. That. I've dated a couple of girls yeah. who... who were self harmers, yeah, and it's yeah, it's an interesting I, point. I don't even know if they were self harmers. If that makes sense, it's like it was like a little, and I don't it, know, like a phase. Or I like mean, it's definitely self harming, hundred yeah, oh, yeah, percent. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Like, but but yeah, I, there was no lethal intent. So the, the girls that I've known that have done that, yeah. Um, and what you know, do you think that is? Is do you think it's because they they're just looking for a, a bit of attention about that, or I don't they're, know, they're a cry for help? Yeah, yeah I, I don't never know. really understood it. So I asked one of the girls why she did it, um, and at the time she said. Uh, she said, so if you've had a bad week, you go out on the piss, you get hammered, you have a blowout, um, you go to the gym, you know, whatever. She said, I don't drink, don't go to the gym. So I don't have an outlet. So by cutting myself, that's an outlet. Um, and that was what she said. Um, but yeah, I don't know. But I think, yeah, I think if you, but you look at behavior across both genders, um, and you, you see it a lot. Like you see people self-harming in different ways though, because yeah. you've, you, you have people that would take a, you know, a, a sharp instrument, a sharp instrument to themselves. That's one way of doing it. Um, but you see other people who just, you know, maybe drink too much, um, or go out of the way to destroy the relationships and everything. And I think, yeah, I think people do it in different ways and some are more subtle than others. So when you say like drink too much, how much do you think drink has a massive impact on like, your, your mood yeah 100 percent. so i think with um again with with sort of females versus males i think yeah females might do stuff like that um whereas i think maybe with guys and again like you know i don't want to generalize here because i know that everybody does this shit so it's not a male or female problem and i don't want people listening to this and and, and thinking that we're yeah. you know we're but we're we, we are men so we're talking on behalf of men right so i think um in answer to your question so i think drinking plays a big part and I think, and this is where I think when you see, when I know, you know, lads and even me personally in the past, when I'm in a bad place, like I definitely almost self-medicate through drinking. Um, so, I mean, an example for me was years ago, I was probably about 10 years ago when I was competing in MMA. Um, and that was basically my identity at the time. So outside of MMA, um, I think it was around the same time I was dating this particular girl that I just mentioned and she was an absolute headache. Um, so that wasn't a, a great relationship, quite toxic. Um, my work, I worked in a job that I fucking hated. I had right. no, no passion for it. Stuck in an office, Monday to Friday, nine till five, with no, with no way out that I could see. Like I didn't have any qualifications at the time. I got my PT qualifications like later in life, my degree later in life. At that point in my 20s, I left school with very little qualifications um, because of where I grew up and, and the school I went to wasn't great. Um, so I had no qualifications. I, I found myself in a job I paid quite well and it was like to some a good job, but there was just, there was no purpose to it. I had no purpose. So for me, like shit relationship, shit job, like no, no options to really change that situation. So my outlet was, was martial arts and MMA and my whole identity at that point was wrapped up in that one thing. So outside of martial arts, I was, you know, I was a bit of a loser, nice guy, but no real opportunities, poor relationships, drinking too much. Um, when you say drinking too much, yeah. I want to clarify, how much is drinking too much? What would you say drinking too much? Is it like every night? Well, you ask the government and it's more than 14 units a week. Yeah, I mean, I'd fuck a government. Like what we actually like, what, what would you like? Well, let me finish the story, I guess. So, and, and you'll get your answer. Um, so I was, my identity was wrapped up in what I was doing in martial arts. And then I got injured. So I, I taught, annoyingly wasn't even doing martial arts. I was in the gym doing flies, but I tore my shoulder, tore my rotator cuff, separated my AC joint. Um, and at the time it was the first real injury I'd had. So I tried persevering through it a little bit, it got worse and worse and worse. And then it really dawned on me that this was a proper injury this time. And I wasn't just hurt, I was out, like I couldn't train. It was my shoulder. So it, it basically just debilitated everything that you do in martial arts. Yeah. Um, and as a result, I completely lost my identity and found myself in quite a dark spot and started drinking too much. So in answer to your question, there were two two things that I did. One was I I would drink literally into darkness so when I did drink, I would, I'd have, I'd know my limits. I just drink right through them every single time. So I'd drink way too quick. 
And then immediately on drinking, I get a little bit of a buzz from that. And then I just keep drinking, keep drinking um, until I literally woke up the next day at some point. So I would often drink to a point where I just couldn't remember anything. And often I would still, I was still awake and moving around and interacting with people, but basically just can't remember anything. And Andrew Huberman did an episode on alcohol and the effects on the brain. And he talks about this a little bit how some people obviously have like an opiate effect of drinking and it's quite dangerous because they will continue to drink past a sedative effect into like, you know, blacking out essentially. So I think that's one, uh, one sort of half of drinking too much. It's when you do drink, it's the amount that you drink and where, where it kind of puts you at the end of it. And obviously the frequency is the other. And throughout my twenties, because I didn't like my job, I pretty much, you know, I'd use martial arts to get me through the week and then at the weekend I'd have a blowout. And I'd quite often go out and drink and when I did, I'd drink way too much, but I only did it once a week. So I'd make an absolute twat of myself once a week, wake up feeling like an idiot. That's fucking most of the UK though, isn't it? It is, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then what I found is when I injured, that went, that, went, that, that went went from a week, weekend, to like a few nights a week. Right. Um, and yeah, and that, that was like, that was quite a dark period. And that, to some extent, back to the original point, was like self-harming. Yeah. You know what I mean? She was cutting herself. I was drinking myself into a fucking dark hole every every couple of days. So I think, you know, there's, there's different ways to self-harm. I think some people, a lot of guys, it seems, certainly people I know and me in the past, do it through drinking. Um, and naturally, I, as a result of drinking that heavily, found myself in a couple of situations that weren't ideal. Um you know, and that caused me to, to after, you know, after a couple of occasions to reevaluate my, my life and situation a little bit. And for whatever reason, I put, was able to pull myself out of that place um, and then started working on creating options for myself and got my PT qualification. Eventually left my job, started doing something I'm passionate about and, and years later, here we are. But I still see a lot of guys stuck in that cycle of of just drinking whether it be every weekend and i think post lockdown as well i think that's had a real impact on people's mental health but also their drinking habits and it did for me again um i got to a point because i'm a, I'm a parent and stuff where i don't drink heavily anymore but i was drinking really frequently and certainly during the lockdown i found myself doing that more and more um where i was drinking quite often yeah um and then something again andrew huberman talks about is when you drink frequently and it might only be once a week but it was way more than that for me. But your baseline ability to handle stress and anxiety is diminished even when you're like past the hangover because everybody suffers a hangover and feels anxious. Yeah. Beer fear. So you wake up with beer fear. Um, but then, you know, sort of three, four days later, I mean, the older you get, the longer it lasts. I've learned that. Um, but, you know, three, four days on, you know, you, you, your, your ability to handle stress and anxiety is still diminished. What I can't understand more than anything is I fucking hate that feeling. I hate that feeling of a hangover. I hate that feeling of <clears throat> anxiety when you've done nothing wrong. I hate that feeling of just, you know, just being hungover in general. I can't understand how you have that feeling, you know you have that feeling, and then a couple of days later you'll drink again excessively. Yeah. And uh, can you tell me about, you? like, I, I'm, I'm a social binger, yeah. so I'll go out and I'll drink every now and again, and when I do I get pissed and then I'm hungover fucking hate my life for a few days and then i think i'm not drinking again and then i'll even say i'll be like i'm like i'm not fucking drinking again every single time i drink yeah. knowing i will but it'll be maybe three months later yeah. how do you have that feeling and then two days later pick up a can again and then start all over again that's what i can't understand yeah. like in my house i don't have even drinking yeah. because i i always i always think it stops yeah. stops me just doing my normal shit yeah. doesn't make me feel good how how do how do you do that. So yeah. I never used to have drink in my house because if it was there, I'd drink it. I'm sounding like a proper fucking al alcoholic now, aren't I? Maybe I was. <laughs> I was never diagnosed, but it, it's, it's fucking it's not sounding good as I talk about it. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd always drink in that. I'd always drink the booze in the house. Yeah. But to, in answer to your question, I think it's the same thing. It's like you use it to just mask the, 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 the suffering or the anxiety that you've got, don't you? So feeling anxious a couple of days after drinking, so the best way to cure that is fucking drink again. Is it? See, in my head, I'm, I'm, I just don't think like yeah. that. I guess it's maybe the, the way you think. Yeah, but, th but this is where I was at, and it's, it's like a slippery slope. Um, and I think, you know, obviously there was, there's was there been sort of acute periods in my life where I've, I've you know, had shit going on, and I've definitely drank more than often. But more recently, I found myself in the position where I was just 
drinking frequently, but not huge amounts, but frequently. What, like a couple of cans a night? Or uh, yeah, it was more of a lush. It was more wine, so I'd have like a, a bottle of more wine. More of a lush. Yeah, I think that's the term in it. Is it I don't I know. Is so. it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, I used to like wine, so um, so I'd have a bottle of wine. But if it was open, I'd drink the whole bottle. That's so common, though, isn't it? Yeah, the amount of clients yeah, yeah. I spoke to over the years, especially yeah. especially women. And again, they would be like, oh, but women drinking wine, say uh, with tea. You know what I mean? I hear that all the time, you know, that alcohol. But, but but this is a thing, right? And this is this is what I'm seeing now because um, I've, I've stopped drinking now and we can chat about it in a second. But you, you see it so much with people. They, they go to work, they come home, they're feeling fucking stressed. So they have, a, they have some booze, they have some wine and then they open the bottle so they finish the bottle and then they wake up the next day, they're a bit hungover, go back to work. It's shit, they feel stressed. A couple of days later, they're still feeling stressed. Guess why? To Andrew Huberman's point, because your fucking ability to handle the stress of your everyday shit is diminished and your baseline is so much lower now that you feel fucking stressed as a result. So then you have another drink because you feel like you're stressed and you feel like you need it. It was the same, it was, it was the same when people- it's So addiction, so fucking weird. But it's the same it? with smoking. So I used to smoke a long, long time ago and it was the same thing where like you, you feel anxious. So you have a cigarette. Yeah. But it's only when you quit and you look back to it and you realize that you're feeling anxious because you wanted a fucking cigarette. It was, yeah. it was the addiction that was talking about it was the addiction that was making you feel anxious. Well, I say this to my mum all the time. She still smokes. Is she? And I'm yeah. like, you've got to stop. Yeah. And she just, she says, yeah, yeah, I'll stop. And then she tries to stop. And then as soon as something triggers her off, yeah. like some stress or whatever, I'll see her. I'll be like, you're smoking again, isn't you? She said, oh yeah, I've had a bad day. And it's exactly that, isn't it? It's exactly what you just said. It's it's that it's that trigger. It's, it's I always say to my clients as well, when they first start a diet, program anything, and they're, you know, they're eating rubbish food and drinking and all that. I'm like, give it three weeks. I'm like, stick to this for three weeks. Yeah. And the addiction, you shouldn't have the same, you know, the need for it. Yeah. You kind of, it, you break that cycle of, of, you know, smoking, yeah. drinking, you know, yeah. you break that cycle. And once yeah. you break that cycle, it's fucking so much easier in it to stop, but yeah. it's breaking the initial cycle and being yeah. like, you know, when you're sat at home thinking, oh, fucking, I need a beer, I need a drink, I need this, you know. Yeah. That's when, that's when you got to stop. And then once you do stop, mm -hmm. it's fucking 10 times easier, isn't it? So last year I decided to cut down on drinking. Um, and there wasn't a particular, like, reason. I think it was just a, it was something that I just recognised probably was, I was, had some bad habits around that was just explained. So I think post-lockdown was drinking too much. Anyway, I decided to stop drinking. I think I had a particular night out and just got a bit drunk. And I was like, right, enough's enough. So I'm just going to rein it in. But I realized that I think at the age that I was, that I pretty much, other than I think maybe when I used to fight, maybe six weeks before a fight, I'd stopped drinking. Um, and then before my son was born, there was a period where I stopped drinking again, about six weeks. But outside of those, like maybe sort of four or five occasions, I'd pretty much been drinking at least once a week for the best part of 20 years. Fucking hell, that's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. That is a lot when you yeah, say yeah. it like that. So then when I saw Andrew Human's podcast and he talked about this, this, this diminished um, ability to handle stress and anxiety, um, and there were a number of other things as well that like people should go and watch the watch the episode. It was it was fascinating. We can probably put a link up there or something. Mm -hmm. um, but when he was talking about all that, and some of the things that he talked about were like, they, they, they kick in like maybe, you know, six weeks, two months, four months, six months. So all these things change in your brain um, after these sort of extended periods. And I was like, fucking hell, I've never actually like, I can't remember what it was like not to be suffering some of these things that he's talking about. And they're very subtle things, but, you know, whether it's like, you know, sort of dopamine, um, you know, and, and kind of just thinking about drinking and, and everything else. But I decided to stop drinking for a bit. Did um, you think about drinking a lot? Yeah, yeah. So th this is this is yeah. what I mean. So, and, and this is like, you know, obviously people are like this with all sorts, but obviously dopamine and the impact that has on your impulse control, whether it's gambling, sex, drinking, drugs, whatever. Um, it's really powerful. So when you... Well, I think when you start doing something on a regular basis, that maybe isn't that good for you. Um, you can, you know, you can you can rewire dopamine so that when you do things that are good for you, you get the same level of yeah. self gratification and achievement. But it also works for negative stuff as well. But what I found is that I would have a drink, wake up, like you said, God, I can never drink again. That evening, I'd be like, oh, no, I didn't have a drink, and you know, it was a real strong impulse, and it was really hard. You know, like I'd just uh, it was associated to so many things. So I sit down after work, think about having a drink, drive past the shop, think about having a drink. Um,
so it was it was definitely having like an impact on my ability to say no and then when that happens though yeah. every time you fuck up you are pissed off at yourself yeah does that make sense so say you go right say i'm not drinking and then the evening you drink you wake up the next morning a bit hungover fuck's sake I'll start, you know and then you probably think oh fuck it or i'll try again but most of the time you think i'll oh, fuck it i've drank now i'll try again next week yeah yeah so um so yeah i would definitely would think about it because i was in it's like anything i was doing it so often certainly after lockdown that i just kept doing it yeah um and then i my, my I just yeah my my biochemistry was just urging me then to do it on a regular basis so anyway i stopped drinking uh the first few days were really tough and then sort of the first week or two was okay and then literally once i got outside of even like a couple of weeks like it was so much easier in regard to like impulse control so i wasn't really thinking about it anymore um if i was around i'd still like mm, yeah, have a little think and i ended up going i think about i don't know maybe two months even just two months, I think, maybe not even that long. It might have even just been like six weeks again. But this time, whereas previously when I'd stopped drinking, it was because of like a, there was like an end date to mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So it was like a fight or a birth or whatever. So I was like, right, once I get to that date, I can drink again. So I, that, I was almost like waiting for that date to come around. Whereas this time, because I was like, I don't want to drink. When I got to six weeks, um, I was on holiday, I think, and I had a, a bit of a dicey experience of a mountain, which is probably a story for another day. <laughs> but I thought I was going to fucking die. I'm not even joking. And when I got down, I was like, I'm having a fucking drink. But I had a drink and firstly, it didn't taste as good as I remember. Uh, secondly, I didn't drink it as quickly as I used to. And thirdly, I left half of it on the table. So even just not drinking for like six weeks, the impulses that I would have had previously where I would fucking neck it and then be up to the bar for another one, that wasn't there. And because I'd made a decision that I didn't want to actually be drinking, it was quite easy to just go, oh, I'll leave that, let's head off. And we went back to where we were staying. And then I got home um, and went on like a, a short break, short, a short while after that. Um, and again, I associated this, it was at Centre Parks. I went to Centre Parks and they sell this particular cider there that I really used to like, strong as fuck really strong cider. Um, strong as fuck. It was, mate. It was about 8%. And so it used to... Fucking eight cider. Yeah. So I... This, it, it's... Um, I won't name it, but it, it, it tastes like honey, this cider. It's so nice. It's like a perry. So it's like a pear cider. Um, and whenever I used to go to Centre Parks, I'd go and get the cider. And it just tasted like fucking essence, mate. It was so, so good. So I was at Centre Parks... Obviously, other than this one occasion where I nearly died, genuinely nearly died, um, <laughs> I hadn't drank for probably two months. Yeah. So I went to the shop, bought this cider, came back, and I was actually questioning whether I want to drink it, but I did. And when I drank it, I could taste the alcohol. And I was like, this is fucking tastes awful. Yeah. It tastes like white spirit. And I'd never tasted it like that before. So weird you say that's how I taste alcohol every yeah. single time. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, what the fuck is people's obsession with it? I think yeah. it tastes like fucking ass, mate. Yeah. I do. So so when when I was drinking a lot, it tastes so different, mate. It tastes yeah, completely different. Crazy. So I ended up drinking three bottles nonetheless. I pushed through. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, yeah, I had three bottles. Woke up the next day, such a fucking hangover, mate. It felt dreadful. And then from that point, I didn't drink for six months. Oh, nice. Like pretty much nothing. And uh, I went to an England game a little while back and um, just to take the edge off because it was obviously, I'm not a big football fan in a way, but um, big crowds and stuff, not always my favourite thing to do. And going out into the stadium, um, I had a, a bottle of Bud and again, mate, just the taste was fucking horrendous. And then obviously a little while back, we were out and was in a restaurant, asked for an alcohol-free beer and they bought me an alcohol beer and immediately tasted it and it just tasted fucking awful. Yeah. So it's interesting. So now I'm in a position where, um, yeah, I haven't pretty much drank solidly, not solidly, because I wasn't like, alcohol dependent, but I was drinking most weekends, as you say, as most people do, certainly in the UK. Um, and then more recently drinking a little bit more frequently as a result of just being stuck indoors during lockdown and forming a bad habit. I... I've gone from like, yeah, pretty much doing that for the best part of 20 years to now just not drinking and not even liking it. I don't think about it. And when I have accidentally or decided to drink, it just tastes fucking dreadful. And it's funny now because alcohol-free beer, which I still drink. like Yeah, 0%. that's I, I was literally about to ask you, with alcohol-free yeah. beer, do you, do you, is it... Is it, is it helping you? Yeah. So, so one thing that I found when I quit smoking years ago 
is I really struggle with quitting smoking as well. It did took me a couple of years and probably a few failed attempts. Um, but I found that I use nicotine patches to quit smoking. Right. And I found that nicotine patches uh, were were really good at killing the addiction. So that anxiety I talked about that you used to get when you when you want a cigarette that you'd mistake for life anxiety, but it wasn't. It was it was, you know, sort of addiction anxiety. It would get rid of that. But I even went through a period, and this is how much I was fucking addicted to cigarettes. I'd have patches on, I'd still smoke. <laughs> there was one occasion I was smoking 15 cigarettes a day, um, yeah. wore patches, carried on smoking, ditched the patches, and then was up to 25 a day. No way. Because I just had this increased amount of like, nicotine in my system. Um, so I found that, that, that where I'm going with this is I found the patches killed the the physical addiction. Yeah. But there was still a habit. That's what I was about to say, the habit of actually smoking. Yeah. yeah. So the association with certain behaviors, so whether it was like eating, getting up in the morning, sex, whatever, you do certain things and you'd have a cigarette. So the habit was quite hard to break as well. But, but when I got to a point where I'd really decided that enough was enough with smoking, used the patches again to kill the, the, the physical addiction. Yeah. Um, and then I just had to sort out the habit. Um, and in answer to the question, with the alcohol-free beer, I found that's been really helpful because I can still go out on the piss, go to a pub with my mates and I'll just get an alcohol-free beer. But it's pretty good now. Most places will serve and you've got like- It tastes beer. like fucking asshole. They don't, mate. Oh, mate. They don't. No, you say that, but I think beer doesn't taste great. Yeah. So I so, don't mind a beer, but- So the interesting thing with alcohol, the interesting thing with alcohol-free beer is that because there's no alcohol in it, um, when I drink it now, because previously when I was drinking alcohol, I couldn't taste the alcohol because I was so used to having it. The alcohol-free beer that I drink now tastes the same as how I remember beer used to taste when I was drinking it often. Ah, right. Okay. So I think you might have even mentioned this the other day. It's like the equivalent of if you drink full sugar Coca-Cola. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you go to you diet. You can never switch back. Yeah. Like you, it takes a while to get used to it, but once you do, it tastes as good as you remember Full yeah, sugar, maybe. and then when you taste sugar, you're like, "Fuck, it's so overbearing." It's so bad, yeah. and that's what it's now like with alcohol. So I, um, yeah, I, I still, I, I, not again, not frequently, but if I ever do fancy because of the habit, fancy a beer, I'll just go and get alcohol-free beer. Yeah, and I quite like the taste of it because I used to like the taste of alcohol and or beer, and it tastes the same. Some of the spirits and stuff taste like ass, so I wouldn't recommend <laughs> them. But but you've got like Freedom uh, by Estrella, um, uh, Corona. Um, and Peroni and Heineken. I think you gave me a brew dog one. Did you give me a brew yeah, dog one? Yeah, that was a 0.5, so it's kind of cheating. But, what, um, what do you mean? A, what, a 0 0.5? Yeah. So so all of the ones that I've just mentioned are literally zero, zero. alcohol. 0, 0.0. Zero, right. Whereas the brew dog ones are 0 0.5. Um, and I, on a couple of occasions, I have drank 0 0.5, and it's fine. It's not like I'm off the wagon or anything. But um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, a, it's, yeah, it's an interesting one. But I, I have found since stopping that my my energy level is much better my cognitive focus is a lot better my my confidence is a lot better yeah i talked at the start about feeling a little bit uncomfortable like being on camera and talking about myself i literally could not have done that i think if i was drinking i don't think i would have started this podcast if i was drinking yeah that's what i was about to say to you like we've had loads loads of hours setting this up in countless hours probably still to come and whatever else and i think if you was drinking that motivation may not be there. It's not even the motivation. Like uh, it is to some extent, but um, do you not, do you it, not but, but, it, but it's like the action that like we talked about in the beginning, right? Where you're like, it does your head in when people come up with these ideas, but they don't action it. Yeah. You know, I've always been a creative guy. You know, we found that working together. Yeah. You know, I mean, I come up with these mad ideas and, you know, you often just get on board with them and say, right, let's, let's get it done. Off we yeah. go. And that comes from your background of running businesses and stuff. And it's a good combination. And I think a lot of people might do that where they come up with these ideas and they, they, they know it's a good idea but they just don't have the bottle to do it. And yeah. I and I found certainly like adding that substance, alcohol into your system and creating that yeah. that lower baseline for handling anxiety is just it just tips you over the edge in not doing something. Yeah, I would never get anything done. If I was hung over three times a week, I yeah. genuinely believe but that it, I would get nothing done. But it's not I'm even naturally being hung over. Again, it's like that is it's like it's 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 that baseline ability to handle stress and anxiety. It's not even being hung over because people are hung over for a day or two. But if they're frequent drinkers... Does that go away? It does, yeah. yeah. But, it, but it takes it takes time. Like you can't not drink for two weeks and it's gone. It takes at least six weeks. And this is the funny thing. And it's, it's very subtle changes. And it's one of those things like, so kind of like weight loss where you lose little, little increments every week. 
you know, it's a really slow journey, but then you look back a year later, like, fucking hell, I'm a different person. And yeah. it's a similar thing with with when you stop drinking, where like, you know, you initially you just don't have a hangover. That's great. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, and then you stop thinking about drinking. But then sort of six weeks, six six months, like you look back and you go, actually, like I'm sleeping so much better, so I've got much better energy levels. Um, and it's not even a confidence thing, but you, you're definitely like, you can just handle more. You can handle more stress. So when you think about doing things that are a little bit out of your comfort zone, like jumping on a fucking camera and talking, yeah, yeah. for example, yeah. um, or asking for a promotion or asking a girl out or whatever it is, the shit that like just makes you feel a bit edgy, like when you're not drinking, like that's manageable, I found. So that's when I was, you know, when I look back, just, yeah, lots of things that I do professionally in my career, but also this are just a little bit more manageable as a result. So with, obviously you, you quit quit on your own, but was there any sort of help or ways? Because there's got to be loads of guys like you who are not alcoholics or are not, you know, it's not affecting them massively, yeah. but it's just enough to stop them doing shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, so what would we, was there any, is there any sort of places that you can go locally or nationally? Or um, that's, yeah, you know, well, not, yeah, there is. So you can obviously speak to your GP. So like we talked about mm. in the beginning, you know, don't take my advice as, as gospel. This is just yeah. my own personal experience. Um, you know, seek professional advice, go yeah. to your GP. You've obviously got um, organizations like AA and, you know, that that was, you know, I'm not ashamed to say this. There were certainly towards the end of me stopping, there were a couple of occasions where I'd considered that as an option. Yeah. And I don't know, there's a little bit, I found there was, I feel like there's a bit of a stigma with that. That yeah. the sort of people that go to that are proper addicts. You Some know, of them are though. Yeah. Do you know, there's no yeah, two ways yeah. about it, but that's what I was trying to get at. The people that are not completely. Yeah. So I, I did, so I didn't want to do that. Um, I just, yeah, I wasn't prepared to, to yeah. be around, you know, people like that as, as least as that sounds but that's just how I felt I didn't want to do it um so yeah I think help wise yeah GP but for me mate it was just I don't know it was it was you know listening to people like I don't know Jordan Peterson Andrew Huberman yeah you know hopefully us one day you know what I mean but listening to people that are out there just talking about how you can self-develop and optimize and the barriers that are going to be there stopping you yeah. Um, so I think it was a combination of, you know, of, of, of identifying certain behaviors in myself, primarily around like coming up with an idea, wanting to do something with it and then just bottling it, basically just not having the balls to do stuff. Um, so a little bit was reflecting on like, you know, looking in on myself and going, why, why, you know, what's, what's the barrier? Why am I not doing that? What am I worried about? And then listening to people like Huberman, Peterson, where they talk about the effects on the brain um, of drinking. And it was just like connecting the dots, really. You know, I mean, I, I, I knew drinking too much is bad. You know, I, I work for a fucking healthcare charity in quite a senior position. Yeah. You know, I work very closely with primary care professionals in physiology, mental health, GPs. So I'm around these people. So I know damn well that drinking is bad for your health. I don't think that comes into it though, because I, I no. think a lot of us know that that's bad for you. Yeah. But I think happiness and what that's a lot of the time what we're trying to achieve. We wake up and we don't feel happy about something, whether it's our job or our partner, whatever it is in your life. And then we try and fill that void with, like you said, you filled it with drinking and other people might fill it with food or smoking or whatever it is. <clears throat> and I, I think in general, we're all looking for this happiness that's really not out there. And I think not saying accepting being unhappy, but a lot of our unhappiness comes within what we are. And I think we all, what was I listening to the other day? And they said that when you get to the top of your tree, so say you, you know, we aim to earn a million pound. Mm. When you earn that million pounds, you just don't want, it It doesn't fulfill you. Yeah. You're not any happier than when you had no money or very little money. Do you know what I mean? So it's the journey along the way. And then it's learning to accept that. And I think a lot of people, if they just took a bit of stock on their life and we're talking about it recently with jobs and things like that and, and me and, um, you know, cutting back on certain things in certain hours that we're working so we can focus on other things and maybe we will lose some money or I will lose some money. But I'm looking at it as my bigger, you know, bigger picture of what I want to achieve in my life. Yeah. And I might take a financial hit, but will I be happier? 
<laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. what, would I be happier if I take, you know, if I lose 10 hours of work, but then my whole life is 10 times better? What am I going to be happier? And then with that extra money, what do I end up doing with it? I end up spending it on fucking shit anyway. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you don't end up spending it on anything meaningful. It's not like I'm spending it on anything that I'm going to like change my life with. I end up spending it on going out, food, just general crap. I might buy a new gear <laughs> or I'll buy like, so, and I don't even need it. I've got six. You know, why would I, why would I buy another one? You know? Yeah, it's it's funny, mate. It's um, it's a weird trap that people get caught in, isn't it? Yeah, and it's really fucking hard at the moment, mate. And yeah, we we we've got a, a financial planner and wealth management guy yeah. coming on in a couple of weeks. Um, so definitely tune in for that episode because I think some of the information there is going to be massively valuable. Huge. Because at the moment, you know, we are where we are, right? In the UK, the cost of living is fucking ridiculous. You Four pound fifty for cocoa pops this morning. That's what I paid. Four pound yeah. fifty. I could not believe it. Yeah. It's, it's insane, mate. But but one thing that I found over the years is, you know, is you're working a normal job and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but you work Monday to Friday, nine till five. You know, it's a, it's a direct exchange, you know, of, of your time for money. Yeah. And, you know, some people do great. And obviously Dan, Casey talked, you know, in length about the things you can do to do better at work and get promoted. Yeah. Um, but often people will work long and hard in those jobs. And most people may not be in a position or a company that they feel that, that passionate about um and what they tend to find is like you say the only way they can feel good about themselves is to you know go and buy something and again it's the dopamine mate it's 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 that little the little thing inside your body that that normally back in the day would have been one of the contributing like biochemicals that get you out your cave to go and hunt down a you know a deer yeah. that you've just chased across you know the you know, chased yeah. across the fucking country for, it's, it's, for a day. It's so true though. It's that dopamine. It's that buying something. Yeah. You know? I used to know a lad that worked for me and he didn't earn loads of money. He lived in a, he lived in a flat, didn't go out on the piss, you know, quite an unsocial lad, but a nice lad, like, you know, great guy. And he, um, he used to go out and he would spend half of his wages on like a Gucci t-shirt. Mm. <laughs> and I used to be like, why are you fucking buying a Gucci, Gucci t-shirt? It's like, you're not even going anywhere for people yeah. to see it. And I just never understood. He ended up spending, I think, maybe. Well, he'd spend half of his money for a whole year yeah. on designer gear that he, you know, he'd buy 200 pound pair of boxes. And I'd be like, why the fuck have you bought them? And he's like, oh, they're smart though, isn't they? I was like, not really, but they're expensive boxes. But I, didn't, I never understood the psychology behind that. Yeah. It, it just in my head. I was like, but we've <laughs> just, we've just talked about obviously, you know, addiction um, with drinking and smoking, yeah. whatever, like, you get shopaholics as a thing, yeah, you know what I mean? I and the, but it, but it's the same like driver in the body and, and, and I'm no expert, expert in biochemistry. So again, don't quote me on this shit, but you know, there's a reason that people repeat behaviors because it makes them feel good. Yeah. And there's something internally that's driving that behavior and that's dopamine for, you know, the, one of many things probably. Um, but that, but that's the trap. So, you know, people work all week and they go, oh, well, I should reward myself. So I'll have a drink or I'll buy a t-shirt and both cost money. Um, yeah. both make you less productive. And, and then what happens is you find yourself in a position where the cost of living is going up um, and, you know, you'll get your pay rise every year with inflation, but it's, you know, you might even get a promotion, might get a new job and earn more money. But the economy and the price of the economy going up, that seems to just like, just, just wipes it out every it time. Yeah, yeah, every time. Out, yeah. So then you just end up in this position where you're not actually any better off. And you end up a bit stuck because all of your disposable income you're spending on, well, bills in some case. Yeah. But, you know, where you're not, you're getting takeaways and you're buying a nice car and a nice T-shirt because it's a reward for the work you're doing. But what that does is it keeps you pinned, keeps you handcuffed in that job. Um, and that that's the trap. And that's where people get stuck. And then ultimately they just get miserable. They... As you get older, you get increased responsibilities. You have children, you have more children. They get older, that costs money. You know, you get a mortgage, you get bills and all these things, you know, suddenly put you in a position where you're stuck and you're stuck in a job and it makes you fucking miserable. Um, yeah, I can agree more. You know, and, and and that's that's the danger. And that's, again, when people start drinking and, and start getting low mood and getting bad thoughts. So, yeah, it's a tricky one. But I think, you know, we talked about it with Mark a little bit in regard to obviously self-development and, you know, that it doesn't need to cost money. You know what I mean? You just need to... Maybe, you know. Put less put less emphasis on money. I think that's a big thing. Yeah. You know, as long as, like I just said a minute ago, as long as you've got like enough money to, not just to live, but to live comfortably, I'd say, that you're not worried about the bills coming through the door. Yeah. Maybe, maybe 
focus on something like that and then well yeah i think it's like we've talked a lot about financial freedom um and obviously again with the the, the finance guy coming on that's kind of where we're heading towards with that conversation as well but i think <clears throat> You know, you can't. You need to worry about the money because everything's so expensive. Um, and you, to to be comfortable with your bills, you need to worry about money. So you do need to worry about money, but you want to do it for the right reasons. So are you worrying about money because you can't afford like a nice car and nice clothes and expensive holidays, or are you worrying about money because you can't pay your bills? There's two very different things there. And I think where people can, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think if you can evaluate your finances and your time again like we talked about with mark a few weeks back um and and if you can kind of understand where you're spending your money yeah. um it's, it's like calories like like pete talked around obviously the first thing you need to do is is get a hold of your calories and I've, I've said this to clients before as well i've often said that calories is like money it's the same thing you save for a holiday you go, right, okay, so I want, to, I want to go on a holiday. So what do I do? Right, let's sit down, let's work out where I'm spending all my money. So what can I do there? So I can remove that, remove that, remove that. Can I earn any extra money? Can I do some overtime? Can I do an evening job? So suddenly you start looking at your incomings and your outgoings yeah. and you start making adjustments to change that balance. It's the same with calories. You do that with dieting, right? It's the yeah. same thing. Instead, same of, thing. instead of cash balance, it's energy balance. It's the exact same thing. So... You know, with a diet, you're going, right, okay, so what am I consuming? So the Pete's point, let's get a grip of that. Let's start tracking. Um, and then what am I spending? Like, what am I expending in regard to energy? So am I exercising enough? And with finance, it's the same, but the opposite way around. So it's about just evaluating your your finances like you would with your calories. And you just go, you know, you just have a look and go, right, okay, well, I'm spending, you know, I'm, I've got, I've got, I don't know, an Amazon Prime, Amazon like video, or whatever it's called, and a Netflix, and a Spotify. Do I need all three? Probably not. Some people have even got fucking two gym memberships. Yeah, well, the, the other one's the internet, isn't it? You yeah. Know, you get Virgin, Sky, whatever. Yeah. You have a first 24 months at £30 a month, and then yeah. it, bang, it's up to 80, and you don't realise. Yeah. And and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not, no financial expert di dialing next week or whenever the episode is, but the point I'm making is you can start having a look at your situation. Yeah. Um, and that will alleviate the need for a certain salary. And then to your point, that might put you in a position of, right, actually, I can take a different job that I'm more passionate about, or I can reduce my hours and then start using that time elsewhere. So I'm not working 50 hours a week, I'm working 40 hours a week. But those 10 hours, and again, you don't need to spend money for this. If you've got it, great, you can do a course. What am I passionate about? What can I start developing my skills on? Can I go to the gym? Whatever, get a PT. Yeah. You can start doing all that stuff. Or at the very least, like spend those 10 hours just going on fucking YouTube and, and sourcing free information. Yeah, so much on there, isn't there? Yeah, so it's tons, mate. And I think I think at times as well, people look at what they're what they're trying to do through through a negative way of looking at it instead of instead of being a, a positive uh, looking at it in a positive way. Yeah. You know, if they're in a certain situation, it's not great. Look at it as a bit of a game sometimes, you yeah. know, and, and think, right, okay, I need to get around a thousand pound extra. What can I do? And mm. and just look at it as more of a game of trying to get where you need, you know, yeah. take that pressure off yourself all the time. Yeah. To like keep earning more, keep doing this. And in life, if you put what you put in, you will eventually get out. There's mm. very few things in life that if you put a fucking hundred percent into, yeah. you're going to get nothing out of. Yeah. You know, it's like with any business, job, anything, anything that you really 100% solely focus on and really go for it, there's not much else mm. if that's that's going to fail if if that's the case. You yeah. know, there's not many things that do that. A lot of the time when things fail, you half-ass it. Mm. You don't put full effort, put your full effort in, you don't bother. I think goal setting is huge. I live pretty much my whole life on goal setting. Yeah. It's one goal to the next goal, to the next goal, to the next goal. Because if, if I didn't have that, I don't think I'd have much meaning. And I mean that in the, the, the most serious way. I I very much, I'm like, right, I want this goal. And then I'll work towards that goal. And then once I get that goal, I'm like, right, what's the next goal? And I think it's a, I think it's quite a healthy way to live. And people would say it's not, but I genuinely do. I think it's quite a healthy way to live because it gives you meaning to get up in the morning. Yeah. And there's, there's obviously different types of goals as well, isn't there? Because you've got, you obviously got your classic, you know, sort of short, medium, long-term goals. Mm -hmm. 
but then you've also got sort of, I think, behavioral and outcome driven goals yeah. as well. And I think a combination of all things are really good. Um, one thing that we'll be really familiar with in the in the fitness industry, which I don't think we've really covered yet, but obviously smart goals and objectives. Smart, yeah. yeah. Smart. I think did Pete mention them? I can't remember. But um obviously, yeah, it's it's a specific goal, it's measurable, it's achievable, it's realistic and it's time framed. And I think if people start setting those goals, then you know, it's 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 yeah, it's gonna help drive them on, as you say. And I think when you don't put those sort of um when you don't apply that principle to a goal. Just like floating. That's yeah. why I was thinking, floating through life, nothing yeah. massively matters. You know, you're just going from, you know, you wake up in the morning, every day's the same. Yeah. You know, what, you, what you're working towards. That's why I always think to myself. Yeah. I always think, what am I working towards? Am I yeah. working towards get better at jujitsu, you know, the podcast, the yeah. business, my family life, you know, all these different yeah. things. And uh, you don't have to write them down, but you know in your head what they are. Yeah. You know, you, you know what they are. Yeah, you know I think sometimes writing them down though is good. It does help, but you don't always have to. You no. know what I mean? I hear people all the time saying, you know, right, me, I've got my own goals and I, I don't need to sometimes say them or do them, but I know, mm. you know, what I'm getting out of yeah. bed for every morning that yeah. motivates me. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Some people, you know, it will help actually writing down a goal yeah. and holding themselves accountable to yeah. that goal. Yeah, no, 100%. And, you know, I've spoke to so many people about this, uh, working as a PT, but also just, you know, sort of chatting to mates and yeah. stuff where they talk about a goal. And I think the measurable one's really, really, really big as well. Um, and also the time frame bit, so the M and the T. Because I think if you can't measure it, and this is what people are, yeah, you know, what, what's your goal? Oh, I just want to have more money. <laughs> All right, okay, well, how much more money by when? You know, and just by adding those two things, you suddenly add a bit more purpose yeah. and, and everything. So I think adding those principles are really key. And what I've, what I've said before, and I, I find this, to be, you know, sort of certainly personally quite true is that, you know, we've talked about, you know, I think previously, you know, enjoying the journey, not the, not the, the end goal. Yeah. Um, so sometimes it's about setting the behavioral goals because good behaviors will produce an outcome. So it's fine setting an outcome goal, but yeah. without behavioral goals, are you ever going to get to the outcome? I don't know. Um, so what I found is it might be, I don't know, I want to earn more money. I want to earn five grand a year more within 12 months. That's the goal. I'm like, right, well, how are you going to get there though? Like that, you know, it's definitely yeah. achievable. You know, it's quite specific, you know, and it's realistic, but how are you going to get there? And that's where you then set those behavioral goals. And, you know, there would be the, 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 the short and medium term goal. So it might be right. Okay. So the long term goal is maybe to ask my boss for a pay rise. So how am I going to do that? Well, I need to create more worth in the workplace. How am I going to do that? I'm going to take on more accountability. Well, how am I going to do that? I'm going to start developing my knowledge around the particular area of the business. How am I going to do that? Go on fucking YouTube two hours yeah. a day. Right, that's that's the, that's, that's the behavior goal. But then you look at it, how are they going to do the two hours if they're drinking every night? Well, yeah. Cut that out. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's a knock on yeah, effect. So right there, you've got, so you've got two. So right, I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to only drink on a Friday. Yeah. And uh, three times a week for two hours, I'm going to go on YouTube and I'm going to research this area of the business that I want to try and then take more accountability for and therefore increase my value in the workplace and therefore get promotion. Yeah. It's the same when I used to, when I was, when I first started personal training, I came in, uh, came into the, the company I came into at the time, yeah. uh, didn't offer gym floor hours. Um, so you came in as a PT, you could only PT the membership or the members and you had to come into that pool of people and you only had money if you delivered sessions. So I had to make that work. So I, came in and I could have just bumbled around hoping and you know and instead I you know one of the behavior goals that I set straight away was like, I'm going to say hello to everybody everybody I see I'm going to make eye contact say hello a eye contact say hello everybody I'm going to make friends with everybody in the workplace I'm going to go speak to the cleaners bar staff reception because first of all I want everybody to know me that's the first step right so everyone's got to know you so literally say hello to everybody, talk to all the staff so they talk to members about you. So that's the first thing I did. So they were my behavior goals. And then I thought, right, I need to get people to trust me or like me. So then, you know, I'd always be polite, always show an interest. Um, so that was the next behavior was I'll say hello and then I then ask them about their training. You're obviously in the gym, really easy thing to talk about is training. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I would do. So I would do that all the time. And then eventually would kind of build up. And then I went a step further where I was like, right, okay, well, that's great. But now I need to start setting some outcome goals on the back of those behaviors. So therefore what I need to do is, is start booking tasters. 
because when you book tasters, you can then get signups. So I would go, right, well, how many clients do I want? So I say five. After a while, I learned that to get a sign up, I had to do two tasters. Yeah. So therefore, I was like, right, well, I need 10 tasters. And then after a while, I was able to backwards engineer that and go, right, how many conversations do I need to have to, to get a taster? I don't know, let's just say two again. Yeah. So now I need to have 20 conversations to get 10 tasters to get five clients. So then what I would do is every single hour in the gym, I would break that down across a day. So per day, I want to have, I want to book five tasters per day. So then I go, right, so I need this many conversations. I'm in here for this many hours. Each hour I'm going to break that down. I wouldn't leave the gym floor until I had those conversations. And they, that was how I structured it. And that was, I was quite successful as a result. Um, but that was basically me just going, right, setting some behaviours and then sort of driving them towards an outcome. Um, and that applies to everything. Yeah, goals are huge, mate. Goals yeah. are, are if, if, you don't have, if, if you're watching this now and you don't have a goal, just go and fucking write one. You know, go and make one, go and do one, whether it's weight loss, whether it's more money, like you said, whether it's starting jujitsu, whether it's going, being a better dad, better person, stop drinking, whatever it is that's in your life that you know, we all know what the fucking problem is as well. If we're fucking honest with ourselves, we all know what the fucking problem is, you know, um, just face it and, and make a goal to either get rid of that problem or to navigate around the problem, you know, so you can have a better life, even if you're still doing those things sometimes. Yeah. You know? Yeah, 100%. I think a really good goal would be to watch this podcast every week. That's it. Once Mon a week, watch podcast. Monday night at seven. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, one thing I mentioned earlier was obviously about jujitsu. Yeah. Um, I think we should talk about that because I think that's, that's just, it's it's becoming a little bit trendy at the moment. Um, and I think a lot of people are doing it more and more, which is amazing. But I think there's still a lot of people that just have no idea what it is. So I think, you know, obviously Kenny talked about it in length, you know, sort of, um, you know, Ricky did. Um, but yeah, I think Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a martial art fundamentally, combat sport. Um, but I think it's it's so different to other combat sports. I think one of the key things I think is... Um, in regard to the actual application of it, is you, you, you know, most styles of, of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu are based around, you know, more, more the sport component. Um, and therefore there's no striking. So you can, you know, there's no risk of getting hit in the head, which puts a lot of people off when they think about combat sports and martial arts. So I think that's a big factor, but yeah, it's Mark mentioned about, you know, with, with Marine training, when you see someone with the green beret or the tattoo or whatever it is, you know they've been through certain adversity to get to that point. Yeah. And Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is the same because everybody starts at the bottom and because because you're not punching each other in the head, um, and unlike other traditional martial arts, it's about application. So, you know, with things like Taekwondo, yeah, great martial art, I'm sure, but, you know, you can be a world champion at patterns. You know what I mean? You can be a world champion martial artist. Without, without hitting anyone. Yeah. And you know that that's that's skill in itself, so like very admirable. Don't get me wrong, but I did martial arts when I was a kid. I did kung fu, did karate, did kickboxing, did all of them. Um, and you know, you go in and you're a white belt, and you get the senior belts, and they won't spar. Um, you know, you do all these dead drills, or people will put them bodies in certain positions, and they'll fall over and everything else. So it's all a little bit. Um, I don't know if that's more, so I think some martial arts like smoke and mirrors, mate. You know what I mean? It's just, well, it's, that, uh, it's illusion. From, from the outside in, like, yeah. obviously I've not done any for years. Yeah. That's what I always got. It's like fake. Yeah. It's yeah, like yeah. fake. It's like not going to fucking work. Yeah, exactly. You know? and, and that's the big thing. And then when I, when I went down to jujitsu, yeah. like fucking, you know what I mean? It's, it's, there's no, you can't fake it. Yeah. That's the big difference. Yeah. That's the big difference. It's like, you can go down there and like you said, you got someone like Kenny yeah. goes on the mats and he is that good that he just beats people. Yeah. Do you get what I mean? So yeah. the person that's telling you, is not just telling you how to do it. He's, he's yeah. fucking showing you. Does that yeah. make sense? Like, and then there's levels in there. Yeah. And then it's, yeah. And then that's exactly where I was going with it. You know, jujitsu, it's, it's a very honest martial art. You know what I mean? Because isn't it, even in boxing, which, Again, the whole point of boxing is to punch you in the face. Mm -hmm. So you could be like a skilled boxer. You could go in with a guy who's a bit heavier with you than you, you know, and he's got a puncher's chance. 
So he could literally just catch it with a shot. Well, it's heavyweight boxing, isn't it? Yeah. One, one punch. Can, yeah, you, yeah. No matter how good you are. One, yeah. Like you look at like AJ when he was in his prime. Yeah. You know, you've got Andy Ruiz Jr. who's like a little fat dumpling. Just hit him with a class shot at the back of the head and he's and he's fucked. Yeah. His equilibrium's gone and he's gone, you know? And that changes his career. So with any striking sports or martial arts, there's always a puncher's chance. And, and yeah. Kenny talked about the attributes. And like people have attributes. The thing with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the whole point on the whole system is about taking somebody off their feet. So obviously when you punch and you strike, you use kinetic energy. Yeah. So you need to create force through your feet, up through the body, and then you're delivering it with the arm, which is kind of like a whip. Um, but if you take someone off their feet and put them on their back, they can't create any kinetic energy. So therefore they don't have any power. They can still thump you a little bit, but they're not going to knock you unconscious usually, unless they can, again, create yeah. energy through the, through the floor. So you take someone away from the floor, put them on their back, and you suddenly make them less dangerous. And the thing with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is it's it's so technical that as you say, there's there's no like there's no lying in Jiu Jitsu. Like if someone's if someone's good. They're good. Yeah, That's if they're it. bad, they're bad. Yeah. And therefore, you know, if someone's good in jujitsu, you know, they they've come in and they've not come in and, and so, don't get me wrong, like some people have really good attributes, some people are really flexible, some people are really explosive. So that does play a part but it's so much less than in a striking sport. Yeah. But typically, you know, if you've got someone who's, um, I'll talk about the belts in a second, because that's weird as well. But um, if you've got someone who's, you know, even a blue belt, um, you know they've spent potentially two years plus really? getting the hass handed to them yeah. to get to that point. So you know that everyone's been through that adversity. And as a result of that, people are typically very, very kind and very happy to help. So when you go into jiu-jitsu, the, the communities that you find are people that are really, you know, welcoming and, and very friendly. And because you're not punching each other in the head, it's it's not, you know, I've been in plenty of boxing gyms and it's full of like some scary dudes in boxing gyms, man. Mm. You know, they're all like hard guys, lots of bravado. Yeah. Whereas jiu-jitsu, you find all sorts on there. We train with doctors, yeah. like scientists, right through to, to hard guys as well. But... It's such a, a, a wide range of people. It's fascinating. Um, so I think that's that's really interesting about jiu-jitsu. But then with the belt system, and again, this goes back to the first point about, you know, these uh, more traditional martial arts where you gain the belt through gradings. So you pay your money, you do your grading, you demonstrate a number of techniques, and then you get your belt. And people can do that without ever actually really having mm. to apply it in a real combat situation. Whereas Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it's all about, I mean, some, some systems might use grading but for the most part it's very much done on application and attitude um and also the belts like first of all you don't get any child black belts in jiu-jitsu you've got you've literally got to be 16 to even get a blue belt you've got to be 18 to get a black belt um so you could be doing it from day dot and yeah. still only be yeah. 18 to get your black belt and that's because of the the kind of mental maturity i think yeah, as well think so yeah you know like whereas other martial arts you get these like 10 year old black belts running around <laughs> Once you're a black belt, you're a black belt, right? So, but whereas Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, like you've got to be a, a you know a legally an adult at least to to be a black belt. Um, Sweet, I'm always wary of them. Those young lads oh, who yeah. come in and they're 18, 17, and they got their their blue belt on, and I look at them and we start rolling, and you think, fuck, he's not a blue belt. No. Do you know what I mean? You're like he's not yeah. a fuck. He may not be physically yeah. strong enough to like yeah. really well, batter me, but you see like you see like uh, these videos on the on the internet now where you've got people saying like, oh, blue belt beats black belt. And it's because because the blue belt's 16. Yeah. And if he was 18, he'd be a fucking black belt. Yeah. That's what's happening there. Yeah. But um, so it's fascinating. But then because you don't have gradings and also in, in a lot of martial arts as well, you have like loads of belts, like loads. So, you know, you have white and then you might have a load of tabs and then you, I don't know, yellow, orange, like all the way through green. Oh, really? The loads, yeah. Loads. Know, yeah. And then that's, you, you see that a little bit with the kids' gradings. So if you look oh. at the entire belt system for jiu-jitsu from the kids right through to the adults, there's like tons of belts. Right. Because you've got the kids' colors. So that's where you get like the, the, the white, the gray, the green, gray. yellow, yeah. orange. Um, and for a lot of martial arts, that's what you would see in the adult belts. So people go through these belts really quickly. I've seen that. There was, uh, for, the, for the adults, even adults, yeah. isn't there a green belt? Um, I've, seen, I've seen, yeah, I've not seen a few places that give out green belts. Yeah, but but this is in, this... In, to bridge the gap between a, a white and a blue. Oh yeah, I think have you I've seen, seen that? that? Yeah, seen well, that? I think the green belts are kids' belts, but I've seen like but they do um, it for adults in America. Yeah, I've seen you've seen like baby and midnight blue belts, I think something like that. But this is like the, you know, yeah. I mean, some people yeah. make a mockery of the belt system in jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I mean, yeah. To Kenny's point, like, do they really serve a purpose? 
Yeah. You know, do they even benefit you? Do they hinder you? Who knows? Matter of opinion. But I think it's just goals. Like yeah, like Kelly said it's like working towards a goal. Yeah, you know. But but this is this is where it's great, right? Because of the belts. So you've obviously got five belts. You have got white, and you can get some fucking dangerous white belts. But then you have got blue, purple, brown, black, and then you've got the the senior belts, which is like going to reds and stuff. But you know, that's that's for like the old school guys. Yeah. But this is where I think it's really good because you can chase the belts because they're so they're so few and far between. So if you chase the belts, you're just going to live in perpetual disappointment. Yeah. So instead, what you chase is the technique and the skill acquisition, um, and and that's where people get really good at jujitsu because they start looking at the game and and building it up. And like maybe what, what Ricky talked about, where he's got that methodical approach, where he's like, right, I'm in this position. You know, where's the missing piece of the puzzle? And you know that's probably then when he when he plugs in something into that game, yeah. You know that's like you know in some other martial arts where you get your belt. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, it's mm. fascinating. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's jujitsu is very different. I think, but yeah, because of the camaraderie you get, because of the skills acquisition, um, because of the adversity that people go through together. Yeah, I think the communities and the support networks you get from jujitsu are amazing. But I think equally. Because if you're clever and you're little, you can still be really effective at it, sometimes yeah. more so. Well, definitely, um, yeah. And as a result, yeah, you see people like their levels of confidence go through the roof. And I think as for guys as well, and this is, was something that Kenny talked about with guys, you know, it's very much a case that if, you know, these days, and this is a fucking rabbit hole, so I'll be careful how deep down I go here, but obviously with masculinity at the moment, and, and you know, sort of for a lot of people, it's considered very toxic. So if you know you're being manly or a little bit aggressive or showing male emotions, then that's toxic these days. But some men need that. You know, we're men. You know, what I mean, some some men need that release. And you know, sometimes they might just go out on the piss and have a proper session. But now we're saying that's probably not bad, not good for you either. So actually, for guys, I think having that release um, physically will just yeah, it settles guys down. And I always found that with the physical adversity, and you get this through normal exercise as well when you really push yourself or training groups. But when you go through physical adversity, like non-physical adversity feels just so much easier. Like, you know, if, you, if you're if you really stressed and you've had no outlet and yeah. things just build up, build up, build up, build up, I don't know, you get a fucking parking ticket and you lose your fucking mind over it because that's just the hair that broke the camel's back. Yeah. Whereas if you've been through physical adversity, and you've dealt with that, then actually getting a pocket, like, fuck's sake, it's annoying. Probably, you know, can't afford it, but whatever. It's I'll weird, handle it. It's weird it. you say that. Do you know, you know I said uh, I clipped my car the other day? <laughs> you didn't clip it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a new paint job. <laughs> but it was after I went jujitsu. Mm. So I drove into town for an haircut, clipped my car, mm. and I was fucked. I was like, do you know what? I just don't even care. Yeah. <laughs> my boy's like, dad. I was like, just don't care. Yeah. Just don't, literally don't care. Yeah. You know, it's just at that point where it was like, I was so knackered, yeah, but in a good way. Yeah, that I was just like, I had no aggression, no, no, like worry left. I was like, yeah, yeah that's what am I gonna do? Yeah, you know it, I mean? it's it, gonna it, get me nowhere kicking off. Yeah, at exactly. myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? What I would say as well with jujitsu, if you if if you get that bug and you're in, it makes you not want to drink as well. Like mm. a lot of the times, I don't want to. Yeah, that never really worked for me, mate. <laughs> yeah, which I, which, but it, for me it does yeah. because I, I know for a fact that if I was to drink, yeah. I won't want to go jujitsu. Yeah. So you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'd rather if you give me the option now of going uh two or one no gi on a Friday night or going out to the pub, it would fucking every time be jujitsu. Yeah. Every time. Yeah, no, it it, it does and it, it increases that health seeking behaviour, doesn't it? 100%. Especially because it's like very performance based, as we just talked about. It's very much about application. You won't like hinder that that application. So you wanna do things like you say that will improve that and you might look at your diet as well. You, you might get look at fitter, all sorts. you'll yeah. get stronger, you know, because you'll get that guy, even though they the smaller guys do benefit in weights, they still at times they still want to be explosive and strong. So then you think, Oh right, I want to get to the gym twice a week. I want to work on some S and C. You know, I'm not going to drink as much because I want to get good. And because because you're developing the skills yourself, you're not doing it for a team. You're not doing it for someone else. You're developing that for you. Yeah. So whether you get injured or whatever, you still always have that skill there. You know, it's like, if it, if it's there, it's there. And yeah. then as you do that and you keep developing those skills, you know, it makes you just just a better person and yeah. in, in, in everything you do. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I talked earlier, or mentioned earlier about like, you know, a period in my life where jujitsu kind of kept me on the straight and narrow. And I think 
you know, I grew up in, in quite a rough area of the city. You know, I think when I grew up, it was, I think it was the third most deprived area in Europe at one point. It was fucking crazy. And I don't know how they measure that, but essentially nobody had fucking jobs. Nobody had any money and half the people were on fucking heroin. So it was a pretty rough area. Um, and naturally growing up in a place like that, I, I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. And it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't my, my, my parents were good people. They weren't from that area. They just, you know, made some poor decisions, I guess, and moved there. And um, I grew up there. But as I got older, like it was, it, I always had a bit of an attitude problem, essentially, growing up around that area, because you kind of have to, because you've been got an attitude problem, then you just become a bit of a, you just become a victim. So you've got to be a bit, a bit aggro to, to just walk down the fucking street in peace. Um, so as I become an adult and started getting jobs and, and moving out of those areas, um, it was, it, I still had that kind of attitude and yeah, it was, it was like a bit of a chip on my shoulder, but also like, I don't know, like a, a, a like an arrogance where, you know, I wasn't prepared to kind of listen to other people and thought I knew best and everything else. And I found that jujitsu was, was so good because first of all, get my ass kicked, as we've said, you know, you go in with all the attributes you want and the aggression and everything else, like someone who's more technical will beat you. Every time. Yeah. Every time. That's why I want to reiter reiterate to people every single time. Yeah, they 100%. They will fucking batter you. So, you you know, you'd go in there and I'd have to just, I'd have to go in there and lose. I'd have to accept mm -hmm. losing. And then, you know, with jiu-jitsu, that it's it's submission grappling, which means that you need to submit. So not only does someone beat you, you've got to actually, you've actually got to surrender. You've got to go, yeah, you've bested me. And you tap your tap your arm or their body or whatever and they let you go. So you do that enough times and and... I don't know, it changes your like attitude and your perspective and it certainly humbles you. Yeah. And what I found then as I got older, um, you know, where I grew up, like left me with a certain sort of mentality, but then a couple of years of jujitsu just like knocked that out of me. And A, I was a lot more confident. So therefore I was a lot less aggro because when people are confident, they don't, they don't flash up as much because they feel self-assured and they don't have to like, you know, sort of, posture to defend themselves mm -hmm. so firstly for me because i felt more confident in my physical ability i didn't i didn't have to posture up anymore because yeah. i was fine I was like, you know people are threatening me it's fine <laughs> like i can handle myself and as a result of of not posturing often almost in every single case that someone was maybe you know being aggressive you know it, it, it was fine because it didn't ever escalate because I, I, I wouldn't throw any fuel on the fire because they'd be getting aggressive and then normally I'd get scared. So I'd posture up and get aggressive back. And then you suddenly go into this weird, like, it's like, you just, there you go, you go, and yeah. then it bubbles up and then you end up in a fight or whatever. Um, and I found that I just wouldn't do that because they could be as aggressive as they want. I'd be like, I'm, I'm all right. If it, if it, if yeah. it kicks, if it kicks yeah, off, it kicks I'm fine. Off, yeah. And I'm, you know, by no means the hardest guy in, in the world, but I just had that little bit of reassurance enough that I didn't need to, to flash up. So that was one thing. And then, yeah, just the, the, the humbling of it, just knowing that, you know, physically you, you, you're not as strong as you think you are. And it just removes the ego. Um, and one of the things that I find with, with a lot of people is whether it's, you know, an ego thing or an arrogance thing, but they're unwilling to like take on new perspectives sometimes. I find that some people are just set in their ways. They won't listen to other people's opinion. They won't admit they're wrong. They won't like welcome new information and new ideas. And I think that yeah. really hinders the growth of people sometimes. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, it's one thing certainly working in leadership now that I'm, I've always been very open to is no matter who it is, if someone's telling me that they think something could be done better or different, then I'll listen and very happy to be proven wrong. It's literally one of my favorite things. If I've got an idea about something and someone proved me wrong on it, then great. I think that's cool. You know what I mean? I, I really appreciate that now. And I think jujitsu has given me that ability and I think some people lack that ability because they're stuck in their ways. They won't listen, they're arrogant, whatever. But yeah, through jujitsu being humbled, um, it just, I don't know, it gives you like a confidence to be wrong. And, I, don't, and I, don't, I don't know anyone who doesn't like it, who's tried it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like you, you think of all the, not just famous people, but you, you know, you, you look at Joe Rogan, yeah. you look at Jocko, you look at all these top, top people who've done amazing things. In their lives yeah and it all stems through martial arts jiu-jitsu you know they they get that discipline and that that work ethic from that yeah so one thing i'll say especially being around it for so many years is is not all gyms are made equal um so some people will listen to this and go i've tried jiu-jitsu i fucking hated it full of wankers got beat up whatever um 
that would typically just be a bad gym. And sadly, there are bad gyms because, you know, it is what it is. I think jujitsu, again, it's because of the application of it. Most people really, you know, sort of on merit will get their belts and therefore they've got a, a particular attitude and mindset around them. But you will get some fighters gyms. Um, you get gyms that are really sort of heavily focused on competing and fighting. Um, and they're, they're pretty fucking cool. But for some people walking in there, that That's might be saying. a bit much. It's at, it's at a level, isn't it? Yeah. That's cool if you're maybe a purple belt and you're pretty good and you yeah. want to compete at a high level. Yeah. You know, or, that's or, where you want to be. Yeah, or you're a local hard cunt and you want to go <laughs> and have a scrap. And yeah. then you're, you know, after a while, you start developing some skills yeah. on the back of that yeah. that toughness that you've got. But, you know, for your doctors and your scientists and, you know, the, the other people that we train with yeah. that, that don't want to get filled in, it may well be that they've just gone to the wrong gym. So my advice to you is if you've been to a jiu-jitsu gym and you had a bad experience, try another one. Like, yeah. they're, they're not all the same. Um, and sometimes... It's about finding the right coach, the right group of people. Yeah, the right fit. Yeah, the right fit. Yeah, yeah. horse of courses. Yeah. So not everybody's, you know, sort of um, ethos and uh, style of, of training will suit everybody. But I think for pretty much everybody, um, jujitsu will drastically improve their lives because it will it will give them a level of confidence that they've never had before. It will humble them and open them up to to you know trying things and failing and being okay with that. It will you know, give them the opportunity to take on the information. Yeah. Um, and, you know, probably the thing we've not talked about what we should, but just the physical fitness. Yeah. You know, yeah, the, you do get really fit, don't you? Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, there's so many good things with it, but, um, but the belt system, yeah, we, we kind of touched on it. It's fascinating because you, it, it takes on average about 10 years to get a black belt. Um, and if you are the sort of person who is obviously outcome focused, and you want to go in and you want to rattle through the bout, you may be disappointed. Um, I don't think there's any quick, if, if there's probably very few people who, who get it. Yeah. X amount of time, you know? Yeah. I mean, you, it's a combination of things. Obviously we talked to Ricky and he's in a unique situation where he came into it in his thirties um, because of his, his position in the army. Mm -hmm. He was able to, to apply lots of time to it. It was 20 odd hours, wasn't it? A yeah, week, 20 hours a week. Time, which is a lot. Yeah, know, it's, like it's, it's, it's a huge amount. But also he came into it in quite a clever way where he was like, right, okay, I really like this. I want to make a career out of it. So therefore I need to get to this point of mm. skill and, and everything else. And he didn't just have the time and do it mindfully, but he's obviously very methodically mapped out his, his style of learning, his week and everything else. So he's done it in a very purposeful way um, over many hours per week. Um so, you know, in that sort of situation, someone might get there, you know, in half the time, you know, he might get... Didn't, didn't Kenny do that as well? Kenny got his, it got to brown belt in three years or yeah, something like quick. that? Like, yeah, pretty quick. Yeah. And that's, that's just but, like, it, talent, isn't it? But, like in no, it, and, it, 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 To some extent, because, you know, Kenny's obviously built for jiu-jitsu, a massive hand, you know, I mean, he's definitely got the, the, the attributes, but, you know, for people that maybe, you know, haven't known Kenny as long as I have, I can tell you right now, that back in the day, that fucker trained all day, every fucking day. <laughs> oh, mate, it was, yeah, unbelievable. So he was another one. Yeah, he did say to me a little while ago, yeah. he was just completely obsessed with it. Yeah, yeah. Like. So, so like with Ricky now, um, Kenny was exactly the same back in the day. You know what I mean? He, he But he he obviously, you know, was there much earlier. You know what I mean? So, but yeah, I remember, like he was always training all the time. And and it was funny because I always worked, I've always, always been a hobbyist, really. I used to compete a little bit, but I've always worked like, you know, sort of certainly back then you know as I say I was in my shit job Monday to Friday 9 to 5 and I can remember I used to get really frustrated because I you know stupidly in hindsight used to compare myself to Kenny so I'd always base my own ability on how I did against Kenny in sparring and I progressively just did worse against Kenny at sparring and it took me a little while to, to figure out what was going on there because I used to look at Kenny and go he's just a man like, why is he so much better but basically, as I was improving, he's all, he's already here, so we're here. So it doesn't do this. It was doing this. So as I was improving, Kenny was at a faster rate, and that was because he was training fucking twenty plus hours a week, and I was training, mm. you know, uh, yeah, a week. So he was training in a day while I was training in a week. So mm. he was just accelerating in, in regard to his ability. So yeah, I think for Kenny, it's a combination of of definitely some natural talent. You yeah, know, he's he's yeah. got insane flexibility. Um, you know, big strong hands. He's obviously built for for martial arts, but also his application and his dedication to it as well. Um, so, you know, you will get people like that, and you'll you'll continue to see them. And as you said earlier about the kids, 
Like, yeah, it's amazing. Savages so, coming through, yeah, mate. So many kids now come through, and you know, obviously, we've both, you know, we've both like got we've both got kids, so you can see as like when they're babies, the amount of flexibility they've got is insane. And then I think as people get older, and they sit in their office chairs and they yeah. stop moving, they lose that flexibility. Whereas the youngsters now they get into jiu-jitsu earlier, they keep that flexibility. Yeah, yeah, they're fearless as well. Yeah, um, and when you're a kid, like. I think, um, I can't remember I heard this, but people talk about, you know, if your glass is full, you know, you can't fill it, you can't fill a full glass. Yeah. So if your mind's full of all these fucking assumptions and ideas about stuff, then you're not in a position where you can learn new, new, new stuff. And literally just to the point I was making a second ago about people being arrogant um, and just being stuck in their ways, that will slow down people's learning process. And you need to knock that out of yourself before you can then, you know, tip the water out before you can start filling it back up. Whereas kids, they, they start empty. So they're and they listen. Yes. They listen because you're an adult, you, you know, yeah. a coach or whatever, you know. Whereas yeah. we got our egos a little bit, and we, you know, we we think that even if we get shown a move, we and we do it a little bit, and they question, come in and go, question it. Mm. Yeah, you, you, they go, oh, put, put your leg here, and you think, ah, is that right? And then I have to like just remind myself, like, no, oh, this guy fucking knows way more than me. Just fucking do it. He's he's doing it to help you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but again, this was this something Kenny said to me years ago. He probably doesn't remember because his memory's terrible. I think, but I do. Um, and we were doing um, we were doing a style of like takedown, and it was where like you grab someone's arm, but you wrap it, so you grab their arm, pull it into you, and you drag them to the floor. Um, I think it was one of Carl Townswell's systems. I think it, he created this. I think it was called Stab, which was basically a system where if someone attacks you and stabs you, um, it's how to defend yourself. And what he used to say was that you know you see all these martial arts where someone comes at you with a knife and you do all these fancy disarming techniques. Often in reality someone will stab you and they go into a stabbing frenzy. And yeah. It's the frenzy that kills you. It's not the, the, the initial stab wound. So it's someone stabbed you and how do you handle that situation? How do you stop them stabbing you repeatedly again? And it's not by chopping the fucking knife out of their hand. And the way he did it is he would he'd grab hold of the arm and he'd kind of use a style of wrestling to take him down to the floor. And Kenny was teaching it and he was, he'd give this analogy, he was referencing his daughter, but he was saying, if someone says like, grab my arm, most adults would just go, but he said to a kid, he said to he said to his daughter, grab my arm. And she's like, on the whole thing, like, like wrapping up that arm like she loves it, like yeah. ripping it off. Yeah. And that's how kids learn. Um, and adults lose that ability because we're like, you know, we're cautious and we're sensible and we try yeah. and use logic. We're like, oh, okay, and just grab the arm. But again, like, you know, tell a kid to do that and they just like, the whole body's on it. And if you- Hanging off his arm. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. But if you can, uh, if you can adopt that style of learning- Oh, this will be amazing. And that's what you then see with the kids. You know, you get these fucking child prodigies now and fuck me, mate. When I'm like 50 and you've got these 20-year-olds coming through. Ugh. And they've been it's training. It's getting more popular as well, isn't it? You know, it's getting more popular. So more kids are going to do it, you know, like, like I want my boy to do it. You probably want your boy to do oh, it. You yeah, know he's I mean? all, he's so. already doing it. He just doesn't know. I mean, he's three, but I'm all, I, I even just things like I tickle his sides so that he keeps his like frames in particularly his size so he's got the elbow and the, the knee in he doesn't even know it but he's he's working his guard right yeah, there but it's, it's it's exactly that isn't it yeah you know? so all them all them lads are all coming through with their dads so it's all getting more popular and it's you know it's, yeah it's exciting though because it's in, in like you said when we're 50 yeah how good is jiu-jitsu gonna be because yeah. they're always coming up with new stuff yeah. always new guards all new new moves and it's that you know yeah they're gonna be absolute assassins mm -hmm. isn't they? yeah Fucking crazy yeah mate it's um yeah it's, it's massive so yeah people if you've uh if you've not tried jiu-jitsu definitely give it a try yeah definitely yeah it's cool anything else i feel like that's largely going to be obviously about what it is we do me sound like an alcoholic potentially and then i was talking about jiu-jitsu but again in, in another 10 episodes we'll do another one yeah and then we'll like not touch any of that shit completely yeah. and then we'll yeah you know? you know, I hope that I need a wee mate because that and this drink's come right through me sorry mate